Here we go. Um, as you may or may not know, Teresa and I are going to kind of divide up um, some of the different pregnancy topics. Um, and I'm going to start off talking a little bit about um, things to do before you get pregnant. Um, so pregnancy is a very like vulnerable and important time. So some things to do um, in preparation for that. Um, we just recommend that you take good general care of your health. Um, so if you haven't paid a visit to the doctors or whatever for primary care, it's good to just get a baseline and kind of see where you are in terms of your blood pressure or are you a diabetic or if you have any other um, things going on. Um, and also important to general health, just besides the physical health, also the mental health is really important. Um, because I know that a lot of times people are facing different mental health issues, whether it be depression or whatever. Um, it's all, always good to kind of get a baseline on that and get that in check as well. Um, other things that we recommend are just, if you're thinking about getting pregnant, well, not even if you're thinking about getting pregnant, if you're of childbearing age and there's a possibility that you could get pregnant, um, we recommend that all women be on a multivitamin just because, and this is Teresa's fun fact, that 50% um, of pregnancies are unplanned. Um, so it's good to be on a multivitamin and take good care of your general health. If you're planning a pregnancy, then um, we recommend a prenatal vitamin um, because it has all the good stuff that a uh, regular multivitamin has, but it also has folic acid, um, which aids in the prevention of spina bifida, um, which is a developmental abnormality that can occur in pregnancy. Um, and that's it. Okay, so I'm Teresa. I'm uh, the other midwife with Oswego County OBGYN. Um, I've been uh, with our practice for three years, so um, we've been here long enough now that we've had a couple of repeat patients. Um, and like Malika, I love what I do, and I love to talk about it, and I probably talk too much and possibly too fast. Um, if you have a question about anything and we haven't touched on it, please just you know throw it out there where we're... Um, open to talking about anything and obviously sometimes people come with very specific questions to their situation so we'd like to um, answer that but my subtopic here is just like the pregnancy period which is a huge time huge topic but um, I just wanted to give people kind of an overview of what to expect during prenatal care um, so you know there are seven billion people on this planet people have babies every day every minute um, and they're, the vast majority of the time, everything goes just fine, just perfectly. Um, but certainly there are things that we can do to help ensure that things go as well as can be, to intervene when there are um, kind of small issues brewing and hopefully help prevent them from turning into larger issues. Um, so the majority of the time, with patients, we're just checking in. We're um, checking on blood pressure. We're checking on, um, you know, just general status. How are they feeling? We're available to answer questions and then provide what we call anticipatory guidance, which is just um, education on what to expect at this time of your pregnancy. So um, when you find out that you're pregnant, um, whether you have a late period or you've taken a home pregnancy test, generally we want our patients to call us. And if you're not a patient, call us and then you'll become a patient. Um, and just let us know what's going on, what's your experience. And um, we'll generally set you up with a uh, blood pregnancy test. And you may have to do a couple because we're following what we call the quant levels, which is a hormone, HCG hormone level to see how far into the pregnancy you are. And then the next step from there, we usually get an early sono or ultrasound um, that will let us know if the pregnancy is viable and how far along you are pretty, pretty exactly within a couple of days. Usually the dates are very accurate. And then from there, we'll give you some information on things you need to know as far as are you on a prenatal vitamin? What kind of medicines are you taking? What medicines should you keep taking and what you should stop? Um, I think a lot of our patients um, assume that they need to stop taking all medications no matter what because there's nothing safe for them while they're pregnant. Um, and sometimes that's the information they get from 
you know, their other health care providers. So if you have a question like that, we definitely would rather you call us and ask before stopping anything, and then again, ask before starting. And then as you're seeing your other health care providers for whatever issue, make sure they know that you're pregnant because they may not realize or they may may not be thinking in terms of is this medication safe for pregnancy. So once we've established you're pregnant, it's a viable pregnancy, how far, how far along you are, we'll schedule a new OB appointment. And that is a really long appointment and it's very full of information. Um, so sometimes it can be overwhelming because we're telling you so much, especially if it's your first pregnancy. Um, and we give you handouts and information, but you know we always want our patients to ask if they feel that we've gone too quickly over something or haven't gotten enough information. Um, so generally you'll meet with either one of our nurses in our office or you'll meet with a midwife and they'll do the education portion. And then if you meet with a nurse, then you'll either see one of our midwives or doctors for a uh, physical exam. And if you meet with the midwife to start with, she'll just continue with you for the physical exam. Depending on how far along you are at that point, we can try to listen to baby's heart tones, um, which is usually a pretty exciting part for most people. They want to record it. They want their family members in the room, things like that. So, um, you know, we're happy to do that. Just let us know, have your phone ready, um, or the people in the room that you want. Um, with that being said, it's your appointment. If you don't want a certain person there just because you want to discuss private things, you know, whatever, your, your mother-in-law and your, um, you know, whole extended family don't have to be there. So that's your call. Um, we're happy to accommodate you in any way possible. Um, so after you've gotten, you know, a ton of information from us, we've done your physical exam and we've given you kind of our plan for your, your care, sometimes it's more in depth because maybe you have some other health issues going on, such as diabetes, such as a heart condition that you were born with, maybe you needed surgery, or whatever it is, um, we'll let you know what your plan is, what our plan is for you, um, and we'll take steps from there. Um, another thing that um, patients should be aware of is at some point during one of these visits, we are gonna give you a lab slip to get blood work done. Nobody likes getting stuck with a needle, but it gives us very important information we need to know your blood type, super important. If you have a negative blood type, there are some extra steps we need to take. And if you, um, you know, are not immune to something or are very anemic, you know, those are important things for us to know as well. Um, you'll be given information at your first OB visit, your new OB visit, as well as later on in the pregnancy about genetic screening, which is a really in-depth topic. I think when I do my teaching, that takes the most amount of time because there's so much information and it's really important for me to make sure that um, patients understand exactly what they're saying yes or no to. And what I always try to impress upon patients is there's no right answer. Um, the only right answer is what's right for you, for your family, for this pregnancy. Um, you know, it gets into people's very personal beliefs, um, religious beliefs, spiritual beliefs, um, as to whether they want to test for certain conditions and um, what they'll do with that information. Because sometimes um, you get sort of a, an unclear answer and it, it can lead you to more decisions to make. If you get the simple answer, which is everything's fine, there are really no more decisions to make. But to determine if you want to do follow-up testing, you know, there, there's a lot of information you need. So um, we, you know, if anyone has questions about that specifically, I'm happy to answer those, but um, it is optional and I like to stress that. Um, some people feel like, oh, there's blood work, I should do it. You don't have to. Um, and then the next kind of big milestone is your anatomy ultrasound um, or the complete fetal scan. And we're looking at basically your baby's entire anatomy. We wanna look at the brain, um, the heart, uh, the limbs, um, everything. We're looking at basically every piece of your baby. And um, there are certain things that we can tell from the sano how things are developing um, if your baby's on the right track, whether it's for growth, whether it's for that certain part of the body actually developing the way we expect it to. And this is an important place where if something doesn't appear right, we may refer you to a higher risk center for another ultrasound and possibly a consult with a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Those are doctors who deal specifically with high risk patients. 
um, our high risk conditions. Sometimes you'll have a consult with them, you'll come right back to our practice, everything will continue as, as it would have anyway. Sometimes there are changes in care, they're just um, you know, new steps or new plants that we'll work with the maternal fetal medicine specialist on. Um, at the Complete Anatomy Sano, the number one thing people want to know is their baby's gender, which can I just say, it's your baby's sex, your baby will reveal their gender to you as they grow, but they want to know the fetal sex, am I buying blue or pink, can I do a gender reveal party, all of that, and I, I totally get that that's the most important part, but we do want our patients to be patient and understand it's super important for me to make sure baby's brain's developing properly, that they have all four chambers of their heart, and um, our sonographer will um, do all that for you and um, can also tell you the baby's sex probably 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, sometimes babies don't cooperate and they're not turned in the position that makes it easy for us to see everything. So in that case, we'll just bring you back, just give baby a little time to get into a different position. Um, it's just patience, children do what they want. If you don't have children yet, you'll learn that I suppose. Um, so it starts even in the womb. So once we know that baby's developing and we've got everything we need to know, then the pregnancy just continues um, from there. And the next big milestone is your gestational diabetes test. So um, I think most of us probably are aware of what diabetes is. We might have a family member who has it. Um, but pregnancy can put anybody at risk for gestational diabetes. And this is diabetes that develops after 20 weeks. It's due to the placenta. And sometimes you only have diabetes during the pregnancy, and then it goes away after the baby's born. Sometimes it sticks around, and then it's type 2 diabetes. Both things can be managed with diet for the vast majority of our patients. Sometimes you need medication. Because the, you, the fact that you might need medication or even just a diet intervention, it's important to get your test done on time, and then if follow-up is necessary to complete that as well. Um, it can be a really overwhelming diagnosis for people. Um, diabetes is not something that's, you know, just easy to manage. But, um, you know, with education and working with your provider, and we have a diabetic educator at the hospital who's wonderful, who will work with you, um, you know, it can be managed and it doesn't have to be this big overwhelming thing. Um, and then as the pregnancy progresses into the third trimester, it's really just a lot more checkups, more, you see us a lot more often. We'll start giving you um, information on uh, what to look for as far as your baby's movements, uh, signs and symptoms of preterm labor, things to look for as far as high blood pressure which may develop, um, and really just to answer your questions. Um, you know, a lot of patients just say, this might be a dumb question, but, and there really are no dumb questions. If you've never been pregnant before, or even if you have, but this pregnancy is different, ask, because you don't know. It's not always obvious what is the concerning symptom versus, well, oh, that's okay. You know, that's just a normal side effect. I had a patient who was really concerned about, um, she felt this, these quick, short movements that just kept repeating for a, you know, pro, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, and then her baby would quiet down and then it would come back and she um, just couldn't figure out what was going on. And I said, is it possible that your baby's hiccuping? She had no idea that her baby could have hiccups in utero. Well, why would she? She'd never been pregnant before. But if you think about it, if you didn't know that could happen and your baby's kind of making these weird jerky movements that you've never felt before, that would be really concerning. So, um, you know, we always want our patients to ask. Um, we have a, uh, nurses um, during the day, nine to five, available to answer questions. And then after hours, we always have a provider on call. So a doctor or midwife is always available. You can call our answering service. They'll get in touch with us, kind of give us the basics of your question, your name, your date of birth, and, you know, how far along you are and what's going on. And then, you know, we'll get back to you and let you know um, whether you need to come in or just some tips you can try. I have patients telling me, oh, I have a cold, I have allergies, um, what can I take? Or, you know, I think I'm in labor, what do I do? So we try to arm you with that information ahead of time, but if something comes up, please ask us, just give us a call. And then, um, you know, as you hopefully make it to the end of the third trimester um, and don't have a preterm labor, then you'll approach a time where it's time to go into, you know, you may go into labor. We can never predict really you know, when that's gonna be. Sometimes people like to say, oh, the baby dropped, it's probably gonna be in the next week. Um, 
I don't like to make assumptions. I don't really like to make predictions because that's the time that baby's going to prove you wrong. So, um, you know, if you think something's going on, if you think you're in labor, come in. We're not going to get mad at you for coming in. Um, a lot of people are worried about being the person who comes in in false labor. You don't know until you come in and get checked. I can't diagnose it over the phone. I can't tell you by the sound of your voice or anything like that if you're in labor or not. Um, so sometimes, you know, the only way to know is to come in and get checked. Sometimes people go past their due date. Um, nobody wants to think about that, I think, as they're approaching the last month or so of pregnancy. But if that happens, it's very common. Um, we just do additional monitoring um, of the baby just to make sure they're doing okay. Um, usually, eventually, you will go into labor on your own. And if you don't, then we have um, processes. We can use medication and other um, procedures to kind of help your body go into labor. Um, ideally, um, you know, the midwife point of view is no intervention unless necessary. So ideally, you'll go into labor on your own. But if we need to help you out, we need to get things started, we have a way to do that. I promise you won't be pregnant forever. Okay. Um, any questions on any of that? Nope. All right, Malika's going to talk to you about labor. Okay, so I'm back again. All right, um, so as Teresa talked a little bit about, there are um, different things um, that are thought to signal the approach of labor. Um, sometimes people describe this feeling as though the baby may have dropped um, sometimes people talk about losing their mucus plug. Um, there's something that we call false labor, um, which I always try to let people know. False labor, it's okay that you have it. Um, the way that I describe it is the uterus is a muscle um, and labor is a marathon. Like labor is actually a very intense workout. Um, it's probably kind of right up there with CrossFit. Um, burn a lot of calories during labor and your uterus does a lot of work. Um, and so the way that I usually describe it to anyone who's had a visit with me is that um, your uterus kind of has to train for this marathon. You know, marathon runners don't get up the morning of the marathon and say, oh, today is a good day to go run 26 miles. They say, no, let me train for a few months or so and prepare um, for this big event. And so your uterus does the same thing. And that's actually what's going on during false labor. So it's okay for um, your uterus to just do these preparatory, um, you know, contractions. Um, the difference between false labor and real labor um, is not the amount of pain that you have really, because sometimes people can be in false labor and it's really, really painful for them. Um, the difference is actually that your cervix is changing. So in real labor, your cervix changes, which is why, you know, as Teresa mentioned, if you think that you're in labor, if you think something's happening, the best way to find out whether something's happening or not is to come see us, because we can tell you. Um, some other things that may happen, um, there can be, you know, in increased discharge as you get closer to labor, um, and also, you know, your water can break. Um, now, water does, the water doesn't break for everyone before they get really into active labor. About less than 15% of women actually have their water break as the first sign of labor. So, um, I've had some patients say to me, oh, is it okay that my water doesn't break? Yeah, it's totally fine. Um, you can still be in labor without that happening. Um, the greater majority of women experience that um, as they get into active labor, and some people, their water never breaks on its own. Sometimes, you know, we help them along labor with um, by helping do that for them. Um, so these are kind of some of the things that happen before. Um, things to do if you think that you might be in labor and you come and you visit us and we tell you that you're not. Um, we encourage you to hydrate, you know, take warm baths or showers, um, sort of work on relaxation um, while you're waiting for the real thing to kick in. Um, a lot of people do a lot of walking. Um, they find that helpful to them, whether it makes them more comfortable or um, they find that they get really uncomfortable and then find themselves in real labor. Um, one thing that people are really, really concerned about um, during labor is how they're gonna manage their pain. There's so many different ways to 
um, manage pain during labor. Of course, everyone knows about the epidural, but um, everyone doesn't have to have an epidural. There's so many natural things that you can do. Um, so there's hydrotherapy, um, which is basically using a warm bath or a warm shower um, to help you cope with the pains of labor. Um, there are a lot of relaxation methodologies. Um, there's you know breathing techniques. There's use of massage, use of different positionings or birthing balls um, to help you go through that process. Um, and our nurses over at the hospital are very, very experienced in many of those techniques and are really helpful um, in helping women cope with labor um, who don't necessarily want um, an epidural. Um, and then just a couple other things that happen during labor. So labor is really unpredictable. A lot of people like to ask us, so when am I gonna have this baby? And my answer is always, well, I really don't know. Um, <laughs> you tell me or let your baby tell me. Um, labor um, for when it's a first baby can really take um, quite some time. So there are different phases of labor. Um, there's what we call early labor, where the body is just now sort of getting into a rhythm. Um, and the cervix is just now starting to dilate. And that can take some women um, a few hours or even a couple of days. Um, you know, So they might be home having those early contractions, but their cervix is not doing too much. Um, then there's the active part of labor where things start to pick up and we, with new um, information and research, we're finding that active labor seems to be occurring more after six centimeters. Um, we expect things to pick up, but it can be different for every person and for every labor, even in the same woman that's had several babies. Each labor can be very different. Um, and then... Let's see, some other things that can kind of crop up during labor. So um, as Teresa kind of mentioned before, the midwifery philosophy is that we treat labor and birth as a normal event. It's not a medical emergency. It's just this is a part of life. It's normal. Um, and we kind of really hope that women are able to do their thing. Um, and, you know, the body will do what it's supposed to do and the baby will um, come out. Sometimes there are different emergencies that crop up. Um, and what I just wanted to kind of like touch on are C-sections because everyone's like really afraid of C-sections and C-sections are not the devil. Um, the way that I describe them is they're a, when, when they're needed, they're a very, very useful tool um, to help us accomplish the goal of having a safe mom and a safe baby um, in times of emergency. So I just kind of wanted to dispel that fear a little bit. Um, and that's it. Are there any questions about that at all? I was wondering, can you touch on some of the common things that would cause an emergency situation to happen? Like some of the most common things that you see happen that would lead you to a C-section? Um, some of the most um, common things that we see are um, Sometimes, so a lot of times when you're in the hospital, we do like monitoring of the baby um, with, we call it external fetal monitoring. There are two monitors on the belly, one to measure your contraction pattern and one to measure um, the baby's heart rate. Um, some things that would cause sort of an emergent need for a C-section would be um, concerning fluctuations in the baby's heart rate. Um, and this is kind of different for every person, but um, sometimes we do see things in the baby's heart rate that let us know that we might need to um, do that. Go that route. Um, that's one of the biggest things. Do you want to jump in on that? I was going to say less common would be like prolapse and abruption. If you want to touch on those, they're yes, not I common at all. Right. Um, yeah. So some of the more, um, so you asked for common, but some things that are uncommon that could happen are um, two conditions. A prolapse cord um, and an abruption. So an abruption is where um, the placenta starts to detach from the wall of the uterus um, before uh, baby's actually ready to be delivered or the cervix is completely dilated. Um, and this does happen in some people and there are certain signs that we'll see or um, symptoms that a person would complain of that we would know, okay, then this is probably happening. We need to do something about it. Um, and a prolapse cord um, happens um, if the water breaks, but the baby is not far enough down in the pelvis and the cord kind of slips past them and into the birth canal. 
Um, and this is concerning because um, there can be a lot of compression on the cord and the cord is the baby's lifeline. That's where they get all their nutrients and their oxygen from. And if that's compressed, um, then, you know, it will um, put them at risk. So in that, in, that, in that instance, then we would have to do an emergent um, cesarean. When does somebody have to decide if they're going to have an epidural or not? Do you need to know two days in advance, that day, an hour before? Nope, you don't need to know um, in advance. Um, some people sort of come in, they kind of like, you know, I already know I don't like pain, I don't really want to try, and they kind of sort of made up in their mind that's what they want. Um, and there are a lot of people that come in and say, you know what, I'm going to try this thing out, and I'm going to see how it goes, and I'm going to write it out as long as I can. Um, so you don't have to come in and have it, you know, written down on a piece of paper that you absolutely want an epidural. Um, it's very common that people play labor by ear and they see how they do. you have the epidural, do you actually feel relief? And how long does an epidural last? Um, so usually it takes about 15 to 20 minutes after the um, insulation of the epidural um, for pain relief, for full pain relief to um, kick in. Um, this doesn't always happen for everyone, um, and we can't predict whether it's going to happen or uh, whether it will happen or won't happen for someone. Um, and let me let me backtrack just a little bit. Let me kind of explain. So, with an epidural, an epidural is a mechanism by which we offer pain relief. Um, and a lot of people think that epidural means that they're not going to feel anything at all, and that's not exactly what it means. So an epidural is meant to relieve pain, but a person may still be aware that they're having contractions or feel pressure, so it's not going to take that away, but it should take the pain away. Um, and then going back to this bit about not being able to tell who it's going to work well in and um, who it will, um, there are some situations where persons would get an epidural and it would not, um, they would not experience the pain relief that they think that they will. And this can happen for a number of reasons. Um, sometimes people get an epidural and they sort of get that initial sense of comfort, comfort and um, due to the fact that they're able to relax and their body is able to relax, their labor will just pick up and take off. Um, so then it's like instead of there being like a gradual increase in pain um, there's like in kind of a larger increase in pain and it's I don't know how to explain um, but if they just get to the end of labor much quicker than they thought that they would have and so that's why they're feeling the pain so it's not necessarily that the epidural is not working it's just that their labor just took off really quickly um, and to answer the part about how long does the epidural last so um, the epidural the epidural itself is a catheter that goes into the back. It stays in the back until the end of labor and delivery. Um, so after delivery, we remove it. Um, and it can stay in there. So once a person gets it, it will stay in there pretty much for the rest of the time that they're going to labor. Um, there are some situations when a person has had an epidural for a really long time, like you know they've been in labor for a long time, um, they might need some extra medication, that's always an option. Um, or they deliver, we take it out. Do you have an epidural or you can Um, yes. Usually you, say that again? Usually our nurses do it after. Do that. Right, so it doesn't happen before, it happens after, like once there's pain relief. Um, you're not supposed to feel that part. <laughs> we try. Um, but yes, and this has to do with the fact that um, your bladder is filling, and we want to just make sure that it, it, it stays empty um, because we don't want it to be over distended just because you don't have that urge to urinate. Cesarean question um, Do you have to have the baby in order? Um, so um, the majority of the time when a person is going to have a cesarean, we try really, really hard for our patients that have cesareans to have um, a spinal um, or epidural um, placed. Um, and the reason for this is because the medications that they use in general, anesthesia, um, which is where they put you to sleep, um, they go in through your IV and so they get to the baby really quickly. And so it's actually safer to do an epidural um, and have mom be awake. So there's, there are a number of different um, benefits to mom being awake during the surgery. Oh,
<laughs> right. So that that is what can um, that can happen. Um, in that case, if we know that that's something that we have to do, then obviously things move a little bit faster because of that, because we want to make sure that baby's okay on the other end of it. Um, but we really like for moms to be awake because it's safer for baby. And also mom can be alert and aware of what's going on. Um, and also be able to have a support person in the room with her. So it's still it's the same kind of girl, though. It's the same. It's it's very similar, but probably it's more medication than what they would use in a laboring patient. <clears throat> and what point would you use like Stadol or any other pain med in labor if you didn't want epidural? Um, so we tend to use IV narcotics in um, the early stages of labor. And the reason for this is kind of the same reason we try to shy away from general anesthesia is because if we use it later on in labor, um, we're worried that we might have a sleepy baby. Okay. And I would also like to say IV narcotics, um, while there are a good option, it's not always an option for every person. Um, we have to look at a number of different factors like where you are in your labor um, and also what's happening with baby's heartbeat at the time before we determine whether or not um, it's suitable for us to give it. And I would say the same goes for an epidural. Not everybody's a candidate. Right, and that, that's also true for an epidural. What are the deciding factors? Um, so for as far as an epidural goes, um, it could be where you are in your labor. You know, obviously, if you're down to the end and you're pushing, we're not going to do an epidural. Um, also, if they're um, structural anomalies, um, I mean, if like persons have had different like sort of back injury or whatever, but the anesthesiologist would be able to um, speak more to whether they think someone's okay or not. And then also um, one of the, we do blood work like when you first come in for labor. And part of that is we're looking at your platelets. Um, and if the platelets are too low, um, the anesthesiologist will not be able to. Um, Well, they're, they're there. They're always there so at the hospital. Right, we can have them called in and, um, you know, they would come and discuss those things with the person who was interested in getting an epidural. Yes. If someone had um, their blocks done frequently, would um, that affect an epidural? I don't think that it should. I've never heard that. That's still an option. So the last piece I just wanted to share with everybody was regarding our smoke-free program, um, smoke-free for baby me. Um, it is a tobacco cessation program, so it's a help you quit smoking program. Um, and it actually exists in a couple of different forms throughout the county. Um, there are a couple of other organizations such as Options that participates, um, and it's sponsored by a grant that Oswego County um, qualified for. So you may or may not know Oswego has the, our county has the highest smoking rate in the state of New York. Um, I don't think anyone here wonders if smoking is good for you or good for baby. We kind of know that it's not. We know quite a bit about all the risk it can cause as far as miscarriage, stillbirth, small weight, preterm labor, things like that. Um, but it's easy to know that something's not good for you. Um, but making behavioral change is really difficult. If it, if it wasn't difficult, we would all exercise every day and eat a perfectly healthy diet and be able to say no to, you know, a second helping or a cookie or whatever your vice is. You know, everybody's got their thing that they really struggle with. Um, so the goal of um, our tobacco-free program is to meet people where they are, for them to develop a relationship with our um, smoking counselor. So in our office, Amber is one of our nurses who's taken special training for this program and taken a special interest in working with patients in this challenge. So um, she likes to meet with them, you know, at, at the point that they decide they want to participate in this program and try to decrease their smoking level. Um, and spends about half an hour with them, just kind of talking to them about, you know, when did you start smoking? Um, how much do you smoke? What triggers you to smoke more? Because obviously, um, most people are going to tell you when I'm having a stressful day, I smoke more than when I'm having just kind of a laid back day. 
Um, and then they work together on setting a goal um, about how much they're going to decrease or when they're going to quit, setting dates and goals. Um, and then, you know, continuing from there to follow up and have sort of just like coaching sessions to help the patient um, just build confidence and build skills to realize that, you know, they can quit. And it's going to be different for everybody. Everybody's got a different trigger. Everybody's got a different reason for why they smoke. Um, and Amber couldn't be here today, but um, some of the things she stressed to me that it's important for her to make sure her patients don't feel judged, that they don't feel, um, you know, that they're just going to be lectured to, um, because anytime you go to a healthcare provider's office, like they're required to ask you if you smoke, how much you smoke, and it lets you know that it's not good for you, as if you didn't already know that. Um, but, you know, we like to take it that next step and help you figure out how am I going to quit if this is something you haven't been able to do. Um, and it's sort of a um, uh, reward, I guess, is they can offer free, and that's where the grant comes in, is we can offer free diapers. Um, again, if you've already had a child, you know that, you know, diapering is one of the most expensive parts, really, especially in the beginning. Um, you know, first few years, it's you go through a lot of diapers. So um, to have this kind of as a goal to get, you know, something free, kind of this monetary reward, um, a lot of people find that kind of motivating. Um, and then sort of to help keep our patients accountable, we have a carbon monoxide detector. It's a breathalyzer. Um, and it can let us know how much carbon monoxide is in someone's lungs. They just exhale into it. And um, Amber can kind of see as your smoking level decreases, that number should decrease. And it does give you some wiggle room because certainly if you live with smokers and you're exposed to secondhand smoke or even thirdhand smoke, that's when the people you live with don't smoke while you're in the room, but maybe they have smoked in the room so that um, those chemicals are in the carpet and furniture and walls. Um, it can account for that so you don't get penalized for that because certainly we can't all help our living situation. But um, by helping people kind of monitor, like, oh, I've, I've cut down, and now we're seeing the numbers, we're seeing that result. Um, and then, you know, being able to offer, um, you know, a positive reward after a baby's born, um, we've had a lot of success for a lot of patients. Um, so if anyone is interested in that, we always like to give them a referral. And, you know, it's something you can just try out and see. If, it, if you decide it's not for you, that's okay. Um, you know, we want you to get there any way you can, and this is one tool we have to help you. So, does anyone have questions about the Smoke Free program? No? Okay. Hi, I'm Kathy, and I am the lactation nurse at the hospital. I have worked there about 27 years as an RN, and in the last seven years, I went on to get my IBCLC, which means that I'm specially trained to help women with breastfeeding. We encourage everyone to try breastfeeding. It may not be for everyone, but it is something that um, it, it's good for. It's good for you, and it's good for baby, and so it truly does give your baby the best start in life, and it also helps mom in many ways. We offer breastfeeding classes once a month, the first Thursday, and I teach those. They're about an hour to an hour and a half long. And there's also childbirth education classes that people can attend. There's about four classes. They run for two hours, four nights, or four consecutive weeks. It's usually on Wednesday evenings from 7 to 9 if anybody is interested in learning more about that. The important thing about breastfeeding and going um, into labor is to know what your body is doing. And when you know what's happening with your body, <clears throat> Sorry, it's a little bit easier to tolerate and to understand that the reason I'm having this discomfort or this is what's going on with my body and it's a little more tolerable and able to get through when you know that it's your baby moving down and so you're a little bit closer to delivery or that the discomfort that you're having is your milk coming in and that's supposed to happen, it's going to happen and so that when you anticipate it, we can tell you what you need to do about it. I'm usually there Monday through Friday, and I'm there to do personal consultations while you're in the hospital, and you can return to the hospital free of charge to have your baby weighed or to have another consultation 
<clears throat> I'm sorry guys, if the baby isn't nursing well after you go home. Because sometimes the baby will nurse great in the hospital and then you get home, things have changed, your breasts have changed, and now baby can't latch as well. So that would be something that you could then return. We could help you figure out ways to help baby get on so that it would um, not be uncomfortable for you. And that's... And breastfeeding is not a form of birth control. I like to throw that out there. <laughs> People try to use it as that, and it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And so uh, that is part of the education that we do provide also, is that you cannot use it to prevent pregnancy. Does anyone have any questions about anything to do with breastfeeding or the classes that we offer? No? I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, our speakers will be here for a couple of minutes if you have any questions that maybe you were a little shy to ask. So, again, thanks for coming and um, best of luck. Oh, yeah. And thank our presenters. <laughs> <laughs> you did a really good job.